Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes and today I'm going to be talking to you about Aikenfield by Ronald Blythe. It's a completely extraordinary book in ways um, that we're about to explore. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to first of all welcome you to my lovely new workspace, um, which you can't really see in the shop, but it's raised up very high at the top of this tiny little room with a tiny little window. Um, and it's such a lovely place to work. You can see I've got my shelves to put things. I'm not all overflowing. There's places to stick things up. A lovely desk. Um, this was the room that my youngest daughter was sleeping in and it was kind of filled with boxes and empty suitcases and her cot, basically. And that's now all gone. Um, she's moved into a bed with her siblings. But you might also hear her um, shrieking around in the background as... Um, She's currently at home. So do try and tune that out as we tune in to talk about Ronald Blythe and Aikenfield. So I think, oh, there's also this rather lovely portrait of him on the back. The, I think the first thing to think about with this book is like, what actually is this book? When I worked in a bookshop for ages, I had no idea like how, where to put it. I'd always thought it was, um, fiction for some reason and then I thought maybe it was memoir and um you know helpfully it says social history um it's it's kind of bizarre basically he wrote it in the mid 60s so 1966 to 67 and he went around his village which he calls Aikenfield it's not his actual name and he went around with a, a bike and a tape recorder and sat down and interviewed loads of the people and recorded his findings to give a kind of portrait of what the village was like. So you end up with about 50 different people in here and often there's a little introduction from Blythe himself, a little kind of quick sketch of the person or the context or sometimes we get things like the school records or um, some kind of agricultural information. Um, and then you literally just have the person's voice as though he's just pressed play on the tape recorder and is um, typing up what's what's been said. So as an experience to read it, it's, it's very unlike most other things I've read. There's no real kind of plot. Um, so actually the, there was a really famous, brilliant film um, made of this book in which the there's a lot of the same voices, but there's much more of a kind of narrative arc and a bit of a plot has been, has been given. So I think it's it's quite hard to, I think it's quite hard to read something with no real arc or direction. Um, and I wonder if you've read this, did you kind of dip into it? Did you read a few entries at a time? I at times found it a bit frustratingly disjointed um, and I think, you know, part of me really always longs for a plot, something to hook onto a sense of what's going to happen next. But the other part of me rather loved this, um, I don't know what you call it, kind of dissonance or a kind of symphony effect of just hearing like a voice here, a voice here, a voice here, and you sort of build up this huge soundscape of, of what the village is like um and I think it's like a, a remarkable achievement and a, a really sort of strange and special thing to read um even if I suppose it feels like sometimes you have to work a bit harder to kind of get through it all I feel like it, it merits that work I'm also gonna make a little complaint here to Penguin about this like minute microscopic print it's like, just please can you just reprint it and make it make the typeface a bit bigger it gave, it gave me such a headache um the other thing to mention is that he calls it portrait um of an English village and I think there is maybe something quite painterly about it um in those sort of sketches of people you, you get a feel of how it all looks I think um and Blythe himself was very connected and interesting interested in the world of art and painters and the Nashes and Constable and all you know he's very aware of all of that and also poetry and there are all these little um 
quotes at the beginning. I'm just trying to find one for you. Um, at the beginning of each chapter is often a little epigraph there. So, so it's a it's a really unusual book with maybe elements of art, elements of poetry, elements of oral history. There's a strong sense of um, listening, that you're really listening to the village in it. So kind of oral in both senses of like it being the spoken word, but also you really have to listen. Um, and I think that kind of brings us on to the question, you know, where is Blythe in this? Where, what is the author's role? You know, has he literally just written out everything that he recorded or what kind of editorial decisions did he make? Did he um, go to lengths to kind of keep the voice rather than correct the grammar or anything? But did he cut sections out? Who did he decide to interview and who not? I mean, one complaint that actually another reader said, which I wholly share, is that there are very few women in this book. And often if there is a woman, she's just talking about her husband or husbands. So um, why did he choose to interview so many men? Um, and what kind of listener was he? he you, very sadly, he died aged 100 um, at the beginning of this year. It feels as though the Suffolk people who he talks about are quite um, taciturn and kind of quite withdrawn and silent. There are several references to how closed they are. So how has he managed to get them to open up to him so much? And is he listening coldly or compassionately? And I think it's strange how, even though he says very little in the book, there is a real feeling of compassion. Um, it's kind of interesting to think how he gets that across. And then one more thing to say, I mean, before we've even really got to talking about the writing in the book, um, Aikenfield is a very small village, and in fact, I'll just read out, um, or is it page 13? This very, the first introduction, the first paragraph of the introduction says, the village lies, so this is Blythe's voice, Blythe writing this. The village lies folded away in one of the shallow valleys which dip into the East Anglian coastal plain. It is not a particularly striking place and says little at first meeting. It occupies a little isthmus of London, Eocene, clay, jutting from Suffolk's famous shelly sands, the Coraline and Red Crags, and is approached by a spidery lane running off from the bit of strait, as they call it, meaning a handsome stretch of Roman road, apparently going nowhere. This road suggests one of those expensive planning errors which, although cancelled in the books, will mark the earth forever. It's the kind of road which hurries one past a situation. Centuries of traffic must have passed within yards of Aikenfield without noticing it. So straight away you get this feeling of this village folded away. Um, you know, somewhere you bypass that everyone walks past without stopping to look. And this whole book, you know, it is quite a long book and it is tiny print, um, is really looking very closely. It really is making you see. And I think it's that brilliant example of the kind of value of a microcosm, the finding really universal truths and this sense of great humanity and what it means to be alive. And especially at this time, at the end of the 60s, um, in this very specific example. And for me, that is almost like the defining thing of a great book is finding that universal in the specific. And I think this book really succeeds at that. So now hopefully you've got a bit of an idea of like what this book is. Um, then of course there are these kind of themes that keep, he kind of keeps coming back to that kind of recur. I think a big one is war. Um, and actually it opens with this chapter on the survivors, these people who survived the First World War. And I mean, the stories of war are so, so powerful and so human and so, like, somehow completely fresh and astonishing. You know, they talk about how, how war was an escape 
for the farmers that actually it was so much easier being in the army than being on a farm. You worked so much less, you put on sort of loads of weight in your first month of being in the army. Um, and then the horror of the, the sheer scale of the number of people who were killed. Um, I think somebody says 60 of us went up from, you know, their local, um, whatever it's called, their local kind of battalion or whatever, and only three survived. Um, and it's just so shocking, so it really brings it home. Um, and I'd say this big theme that kind of threads its way through so many of the different settings, whether that's like the farm or the blacksmith or the school, is this real tension between the kind of new modern age of the 60s of machines and convenience um, against tradition and the sort of past of crafts and hands and and man is this kind of turning man basically being replaced by machines um, and that plays out in this complicated attitude to the past where partly there's this feeling of nostalgia and regret and what's been lost and partly this kind of relief of what's changed and the idea of progress and what's been gained and that tension is just felt like again and again um so you know and, and our walks will we'll really talk about that um just look at the rest of my notes here um there's a very shocking moment perhaps i'll just read it out where someone's talking about the acute poverty um yeah, so this is Fred Mitchell, 85, who's a horseman. A lot of, lots of the characters are called horsemen and things because, of course, before the tractors and the harvesters, you needed so many men to, to look after the horses. Um, he suffered this terrible accident and got no compensation. And he said, I had to struggle to bring the family up. You had to nearly perish to bring a family up then. It was too much. There wasn't a penny for nothing. They have money now, don't they? We didn't have money. I never had no good times. Nothing began to happen until my boys were all grown up and I was getting old. But there, I wasn't the only one. The farmers were sharp with us. If you couldn't do a job, you were reminded that plenty more could. So you had to be careful. I had to accept everything my governor said to me. I learnt never to answer a word. I don't say nothing. Today, you can be a man with men, but not then. That is how it was. It will never be like that again. I lived when other men could do what they liked with me. We feared so much. We even feared the weather. Today, a farmer must pay for the week, whatever the weather. But we were always being sent home. We dreaded the rain. It washed our few shillings away. And a bit later, he says, um, I had all these sons and no money. I had to make a decision, food or clothes. Never mind the clothes, I thought. I sent my sons to the chapel raggedy. We can see your boys are filling out, the molders used to laugh. If you're looking that close, you can also see that they are spotless, I said. They were fed, they were clean, I couldn't dress them too. Sometimes when I look back on it all, it makes me feel bad, but I shall have to forget, shan't I? Wise people are men who have learned how to forget. Um, I mean, there's so much there in this book that's so much about remembering. I think it touches a little bit there on the kind of political struggles and class struggles that again is another real thread in this book. There's a sort of shocking and astonishing interview with a gardener at the big house who, you know, they were never allowed to be seen by the um, by the owners of the house. Um, which, yeah, and if they passed, they had to stand looking, like facing the walls. They couldn't look at them. Um, so it's absolutely, kind of abysmal <laughs> and I think there's a feeling that a lot of the workers couldn't afford the union fee and how that has all changed and progressed but there's also something has been lost um, but for me what this book really comes down to is the idea of community and what kind of community is there or are they in fact very isolated anyway I've run out of time now but um Thank you, and I'd love to know your thoughts on the book. Please do um, share them below.